Gentlemen, it's Aaron Bolma here, serving as military specialist for Carlton County. I'm going to give you the second part of the Cold War, Canada in the Cold War presentation. So what we're looking at here, this of course is um, 1948, uh, the year before NATO is created. And this is when, of course, this is another um, step in the mistrust between East and West. And of course, the two superpowers... The new term superpower, which means global power, global um, economic and military influence and power. Um, the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, of course, have divided up Germany. Uh, and, of course, East and West is divided up and it's divided into four parts. Uh, and, of course, here you can see the Soviet sector. And here is the fr um, here we have the British and the Americans and, of course, um, you have the French sector, and it's, of course, the divide. Um, the divide between East and West is ever more um, mistrusting, definitely. Um, very untrusting, of course, further on between uh, capitalism versus communism. Of course, um, an American-occupied zone, a British-occupied zone, and a French-occupied zone, Berlin... The German capital city was located deep in the Soviet zone, but it was also divided into four sections. In June 1948, the Russians who wanted Berlin all for themselves closed all highways, railroad, railroads, and canals from Western occupied Germany into um, Western occupied Berlin. This, they believed, would make it po impossible for the people who lived there to get food or any other supplies and would eventually drive Britain, France, and the U.S. out of the city for good. It didn't happen that way, and this is why they created the Berlin Airlift. Um, instead of retreating from Western Berlin, however, the U.S. and its allies decided to supply their sectors of the city from the air. This effort, known as the Berlin Airlift, lasted for more than a year and carried more than 2.3 million tons of cargo into West Berlin. So this is one major, uh, one to cover this. This is one major step in more of the hostility, political, military, and economic hostility that the, uh, the Soviets uh, in the West are facing. And of course, this leads to eventual uh, lock and complete shutdown between East and West Berlin, um, except, of course, the Western sector, uh, of course, can access, even though it's in East Germany, they can uh, certainly, there's West Berlin, uh, which is still as full access to West Germany. Uh, but, of course, East Berlin has uh, full access with East Germany. Um, but eventually, this is what happens, um, the the wall yeah, of course, the as I've talked about before, the Iron Curtain is only strengthening. The Iron Curtain is just uh, the beginning of the, um, of course, the what will become um, <clears throat> the East and West pa um, face off, and in inclu including nuclear. Uh, possible nuclear escalation into nuclear war. So, where does Canada face in all this? What does Canada face in all this? Canada, being the closest ally to the United States, is a founding member with uh, Prime Minister uh, Louis Saint Laurent. Uh, Louis Saint Laurent becoming, um, you know, we are becoming a we become a founding member of, of NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And we certainly have, we eventually install radar centers um, that, you know, the pine tree line and the, the distant early warning line. Um, and I'll explain those a bit later. Uh, radar sites that will um, protect North America. And that's including the threat of um, nuclear weapons, from uh, bombers, early bombers, the Bear Bombers, the Badger Bombers, and the uh, Bison nuclear bombers going over the North Pole and taking out our cities and, of course, American targets. We are within those targets. 
and of course so this will be explained in this presentation of how we certainly take part in that and of course i've explained about how canada takes part in the development of the atomic bomb and the development of uh you know the nuclear apparatus that really sustained uh peace for the west in the cold war so going from where i was uh, talking to here louis st laurent uh um our prime minister at the time uh was leading uh was he was a leading proponent of the establishment of the north atlantic treaty organization and that was in 1949 serving as an architect and signatory of the treaty document involving involvement in such an organization marked a departure from king who had been um reticent uh reticent about joining um a military alliance under his leadership canada supported the united nations un in the korean war and committed the third largest overall contributions of troops ships and aircraft to the un forces um to the un forces operations to this conflict and i will talk about korea here in a, in a number of minutes troops to korea were selected on a voluntary basis in 1956 under his direction st laureate's uh, secretary of state for external affairs lester b pearson uh helped solve the suez crisis in 1956 between great britain france israel and egypt bringing forward saint laurent's 1946 views on a u.n military force in the form of the united nations emergency force unef or peacekeeping so that's where we got our kind of context of peacekeeping that even through lasted up until the 1990s and even up until to today such as Mali and, and other sorts, but they're more of a forceful peacekeeping in that context. Um, it is widely believed that the activities directed by St. Laurian and Pearson could well have avoided a nuclear war. These actions were recognized when Pearson won the 1957 Nobel Peace Prize. So just an overview of the beginning. Um, the Cold War was rooted in the collapse of the American and British and Soviet alliance that defeated the Germans and Japanese during the Second World War. Of course, already divided ideologically and deeply suspicious of each other's side world plans, American and British diplomatic relations with Joseph Stalin's Soviet Union cooled um, after the war over several over several items in particular the soviets placed and kept local communist parties in power uh in puppet governments once uh in independent countries across eastern europe were were formed and um and without due diplomatic process the situation uh led former british prime minister winston sir winston churchill to state in 1946 that an iron curtain had ascended across eastern europe and that is um that is very true from 1946 so this is just bringing back to what i was talking about before in the beginning um that same year the canadian government revealed that it had given political asylum to igor um uh, Gorz uh, gorzenko who in september 1945 as a cyber clerk at the soviet embassy in ottawa had stolen documents showing soviet spies at work in american british and canadian government and scientific departments this event brought home the new world reality to canadians that the following year 1947 that and of course american uh, financier and presidential advisor bernard uh Baruch, uh Baruch, um ultimately uh, and observed in a speech that uh we are today in the midst of a cold war and so that's just some of the beginning statements of canada's involvement as well as the spies that are trying to gain uh, spies on either side are always trying to gain the advantage of military technological skills espionage and also uh, trying to exploit the weaknesses of either government spies on the ground are will have a harder time in the soviet union because it's a closed society anything that is not uh anything that is not standard sticks out and you know of course 
what used to be the NKVD uh, secret police in the Second World War under uh, Stalin and, and, and before that, and of course, uh, of course, previous preceding agencies OKPU from mid twenty, uh, so OGPU nineteen twenty three nineteen thirty four, and then of course. Um, NKGB, and that was the NKGB, uh, and of course, that was from 1943 to 46, uh, and of course, what becomes the, in 1954, the KGB. Um, these members, of course, are, you know, Directorate S are the ones that are overseas in America and in Canada trying to spy and get information from us. Uh, of course, and agencies like that, uh, internal security agencies, uh, internal security operations, um, <clears throat> um, what would uh, is be, they, they are what would be looking for American and Western, uh, Canadian, British, French, Western um, spies in the Soviet Union. In a closed society, it's easier to stick out like a sore thumb. Um, but in our society is an open society. We had members, uh, director at S members that were trained in, um, intelligence operations, intelligence gathering, manipulation, um, and of course, uh, trained just as in special forces tactics, uh, Sistema, uh, the system, a martial arts, um, this, the Soviet martial arts, um, <clears throat> techniques and very effective they, they were deadly fighters but they, of course they lived as they were american and canadians um this is a very true of the period between from the 60s to the 80s to even the, the 90s um now of course now we have the russians have the fsb um federal security bureau and in the svr which uh which is intelligence services outside the russian federation um and beyond um, <clears throat> so and of course that is some of the technical technological aspect of uh, intelligence gathering within the Cold War more about Pearson Pearson and his two colleagues known today as the three wise men recommended increased political consultation and dialogue among members in a report enti uh, entitled the report of the committee of, of three um, on non-military co uh, cooperation in NATO. The report's ideas about enhanced economic partnerships and cultural connections were not implemented, but two major initiatives were adopted. A more robust information program to explain NATO and its mission better to allied audiences, and the creation of a NATO science program which has encouraged scientific and technological innovation across the alliance and provided support to many noble uh, laureates. Ultimately, Pearson and his colleagues laid the foundation for the development of NATO in the non-military field and more broadly in the development of political consultation between members. So consul consultation between West Germany, uh, France, uh, Great Britain, Canada, US, um, and those founding members, and of course we, uh, and in Italy, um, and more members uh, have joined. You know, within the last 10, 15 years, uh, you know, the Soviet Union breaks up, 91, and NATO is the last str strong, ultimate standing alliance in the world. Here we have, of course, the the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc. The Iron Curtain being, as you see here, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. And then eventually, of course, uh, Yugoslavia is a, a communist state. They are, um, yeah, they are a communist um, <clears throat> country that has um, a line under Tito, um, I believe his name is. And he was in office, so uh, 19th Prime Minister of Yugoslavia and, and a, a Soviet sphere influence. Um, 
from he was in office from uh, November 1944 to June 1963 and of course um, served in office as uh, first secretary general to of the non-aligned movement and it was in a sense a non-aligned movement but they were more shifted uh, Soviet based they were definitely um, communist aligned um, Yugoslavia and Albania um, so they of course as you can see here they are part of the red sphere so you have the the <clears throat> Here you have the Soviet sphere, and then you have the the, uh, the Western sphere. Now that's not named right, but uh, of course here you have France, Switzerland, Italy, Austria, West Germany, uh, Luxembourg, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Ireland, Norway, uh, Norway, and, and eventually Finland and, and, and Sweden. Um, not every country uh, comes into this right away, but of course Turkey is a NATO country, Greece is a NATO country, um, Corsica, Sardinia, uh, Sicily, and Portugal, and of course United States and Canada, and uh, and Iceland does yes, Iceland does play a part. Of course, uh, Reykjavik uh, or Reykjavik airfield um, is a major. Um, dropping off point for air forces in the Cold War, and it's a major uh, NATO standing base with the with the support of uh, Iceland, the Icelandic government. Joseph Vissaronovich Stalin, of course, being the ruler, uh, the supreme um, supreme ruler of the Soviet Union, uh, the premier of the Soviet Union from 1927 after the death of Lenin until 1953. He certainly uh, he served as both General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and Chairman of the Council of Ministers of the Soviet Union. So he what, ruled as an iron fit, ruled with an iron fist, having a a, a purge of, of military officers um, in the 1930s. The Soviet military didn't have a lot of experienced army personnel capable of leading. Uh, you know, large forces it, in the time of uh, 1941 when the, when the Germans invaded, and that's why they fared very badly and bad advice in, in some instances, um, including the Stalin uh, was a man who uh, imposed fear, but he was also very fearful of traitors. Anybody that spoke against him disappeared. Um, after, of course, these, uh, in a sense, what we call them pogroms, these um, crackdowns on society happened daily. Uh, but throughout the war, they were uh, certainly much lessened. And the Soviet people all band together, men, women, and, and children fighting Nazi Germany uh, to the bitter end. And with the September, uh, or sorry, with the with surrender May eighth, nineteen forty five, of course now the situation changes, and once again he cracks down again with um, <clears throat> gulags across uh, the Urals, uh, across uh, the Soviet Union, um, and anybody that disagreed with the party, different different aspects of uh, trying to use freedom of speech. Uh, Acts against Stalin, uh, they were arrested. They could be sent to gulags. Uh, many of them did not survive. Millions of people died, including many German prisoners of war. Much like uh, similar in the fashion that that Soviet prisoners of war died under Nazi in Nazi concentration camps. This year lasted many years longer. Uh, the brutal crackdowns were felt among many in Soviet society. And when he died in 1953, of course, things had certainly uh, changed. Um, <clears throat> certainly changed for, in a sense, the better as far as uh, a relaxed, uh, somewhat relaxed state. Um, and more in a revisioning state when Nikita Khrushchev takes over as Soviet leader. Uh, Soviet Premier. The uh, Soviet rule, of course, 
had and the Soviet Union was devastated after the war. Um, 27 million lives have been lost. The um, Soviet Union, of course, being a, a mass, a major power, but of course with the largest army, uh, many of the the conscripts, you know, they they stayed on uh, in the Soviet army, but of course in occupying um, Eastern Europe. The Soviet Union did um, put, they did share with the West when this was in 1945, 46 and onward, they did share um, evidence of war crimes, of Nazi uh, Nazi atrocities and from Auschwitz to uh, areas in Poland from uh, Medinek, uh, Sobibor, Treblinka with the West in a collaboration effort um, and that would be of course, part of the Nuremberg trials, um, <clears throat> which um, many Nazis, some many had killed themselves, many had not. The ones being uh, were trialed, many were trialed and, and executed in uh, in the Nuremberg trials. That's that same evidence came from Soviet um, Soviet. Uh, <clears throat> documentation as well as Western documentation. Um, Stalin um, does not have the bomb until 1949. 1949 everything changes. The monopoly, the monopoly, uh, there's already the Cold War going on, the monopoly over the atomic bomb ends. August 29th, 1949, the Soviet Union tests their first atomic bomb. At a remote test site in uh, Semipolonetsk uh, in Kazakhstan, the USSR, the Soviet Union, CCCP, successfully detonates its first atomic bomb, codenamed First Lightning. In order to measure the effects of the blast, the Soviet scientists constructed buildings, bridges, and other civilian structures in the vicinity of the bomb. They also placed animals in cages nearby so that they could test the effects of nuclear radiation on human-like mammals. The atomic explosion, which measured 20 kilotons of TNT, was roughly equally to, equal to Trinity, the first uh, U.S. atomic blast, destroyed, which destroyed structures and incinerated the animals. On September 3rd, a U.S. spy plane flying off the coast of Siberia picked up the first evidence of radioactivity from the explosion. Now, here's some of the uh, stolen designs from the the West, I believe it is. Um, of course, from Los Alamos. Of course, they got it from uh, the Soviet side agents at Los Alamos. And they begin with the development of, you know, of course, their, their own reactors and then, of course, their own atomic bomb, which they test in 1949. <clears throat> Later that month, President Harry S. Truman announced to the American people that the Soviets, too, had the bomb. Three months later, Klaus Fuchs, a German-born uh, physicist who had helped the United States build its first atomic bombs, was arrested for passing nuclear se secrets to the Soviets. While stationed at U.S. Atomic Development Headquarters during the Second World War, Fuchs uh, had given the Soviets precise information um, about the U.S. atomic program, including a blueprint of the Fat Man atomic bomb, which I mean you might have seen on here, um, later dropped on Japan, and of course everything the Los Alamos scientists knew about the uh, hypothesized hydrogen bomb. Amazing. The revelations of Fuchs' espionage, uh, coupled with the loss of U.S. atomic uh, supremacy, led President Truman to order development of the hydrogen bomb. A weapon theorized to be hundreds of times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped on Japan. And of course in uh, November 1st, 1952, the United States successfully tested uh, Mike, the world's first hydrogen bomb. Mike was 10.4 uh, megaton, 10 million tons of HE. Unbelievable power. And of course so 10.4 megaton, and that's what we call thermonuclear. Uh, it's a chain reaction that eventually, of course, 
you're using uh, a fission bomb inside a fusion bomb. What this is is a fusion device. Um, a fission bomb inside a fusion bomb. And of course, it instantly vaporized an entire island uh, and left behind a crater more than a mile wide. Through three years later, in November 90, uh, on November 22nd, 1955, the Soviet Union detonated its first hydrogen bomb on the same principle of radiation implosion. And then, of course, that's the development of the, the superpowers developed, both having the hydrogen bomb. So this is RDS-1, or Joe-1. This is the first bomb dropped. This is uh, the first bomb dropped as uh, the first test that the Soviet Union had ever conducted. Um, so it detonated, uh, of course, at 7 a.m. And, of course, blast yield at 20 to 22 kilotons. Uh, in the trial of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, which are that's which comes up, it was discovered that the design of the RDS-1 was obtained via espionage from documents stolen from the Los Alamos lab, with the help, I'm assuming, of Klaus Fuchs being involved in that. Um, certainly, this bomb is definitely uh, designed as an implosion type weapon. Um, it's very similar to the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki. RDS-1 also had a solid plutonium core. The bomb designers had developed a more sophisticated design, tested later as RDS-2, but rejected it because of the known reliability of the Fat Man type design. The Soviets having received extensive intelligence on the design of the Fat Man bomb during the Second World War. And that was uh, discovered during the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, Ethel Rosenberg uh, during the Venona project, and that was, and that's including that as well. And of course, this new bomb um, to test the effects of this new weapon, workers constructed houses made of wood and bricks, along with a bridge and a simulated metro railway in the vicinity of the test site. Armored uh, hardcore, or sorry, armored hardware and approximately fifty aircraft were also brought. Uh, to the testing grounds as well as over 1,500 animals to test the bomb's effects on life. <clears throat> the resulting data um, showed the RDS explosion to be 50% more destructive than the original estimated by its engineers. And this has happened numerous times in the Cold War when they're testing a weapon. Um, later on, we'll talk about Castle Bravo, which was like 10 times what it, or well five times i'm not sure how much uh but it was a lot more powerful than what it was supposed to be it ended up being 15 megatons uh a lot more powerful and it was a dirty uh, nuclear test that happened uh um in the bikini atoll area i think it was um, in south pacific um of course, in the Bikini Atoll area, of course, the U.S. is testing atomic bombs like crazy. Um, the superpowers become obsessed with nuclear weapons and their development and how to deliver them. Early in the 40s, or sorry, er, early, late in the 40s, early in the 50s, and onward to the 60s, um, new bombers aircraft were developed to drop hydrogen bombs, carry more than one, carry uh, in longer range, more powerful weapons uh, at greater distances. And this um, continued on with the development of weapons um, based in even, uh, we had weapons even based here in New Brunswick. Part of Canada's role in the Cold War, we even had weapons based here in New Brunswick. Chatham Air Base, old Cold War, Cold War, Cold War Air Base which had the Genie air-to-air um, nuclear-tipped air-to-air uh, -air, uh, missile, which is meant to shoot down bombers, uh, Soviet bombers grouped together as they're coming over the North Pole. Five RDS-1 weapons were completed as a pilot series by March 1950 with a, de with a serial production of the weapon that began in December 1951. And so this is, they start developing, you know, they start building 10, 20, then, then different types, then hundreds later on as, as uh, 
53, 54 comes on, and then the U.S. Is, is really ramped up production of atomic and then hydrogen bomb weapons as they have the lead in the technology at the time. President Truman's dramatic announcement that Russia has created an atomic explosion sends reporters racing for Flushing Meadow, where Russia's Vashinsky arrives to address right. the United Nations. Mr. Vashinsky, have you got any statement about President no, Truman's statement please, on the atomic please, bomb? Please, 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 excuse me. Does Russia have the atomic bomb? Yes, sir. Well, what would you reply to me? do? The Russian foreign minister maintains his silence about Russia's atomic progress in his address. He accuses the West of planning atomic war and urges the outlawing of atomic weapons. But he makes no reference to Russian agreement on international inspection, keystone to control. Secretary of State Atchison says of America's stand... ...connection with the president's statement that there has been an atomic explosion in the Soviet Union, I wish to emphasize that from the very beginning of the development of atomic energy, this nation has been determined to do everything in its power to proceed toward a truly effective international system of control ourselves to get something on paper that was not really effective. The president's statement underlines the importance of having an effective method of control. Assembly President Romulo addresses East and West. If the announcement made by President Truman that the Soviet Union now has the atomic bomb is true, then item number 23 in the agenda of the present session of the Assembly will project itself as one of the most important questions that we will take up. The impasse that now exists regarding the international control of atomic energy must be broken. And of course, this announcement, uh, what you've just seen, uh, very troublesome uh, from the West. This is just a, a massive turning point in the Cold War, with, which had just begun. Um, once the Soviet Union was confirmed to be in possession of a, the atomic bomb, Pressure uh, mounted to develop the first hydrogen bomb for the United States. You see here, this of course, uh, air control and warning system. So, in uh, what I believe it is, at Peterson Air Force Base, the headquarters of NORAD and the NORAD United States Northern Command, U.S. Northcom center they're located at pearson air at peterson air force base in el paso county that's right outside near colorado springs in colorado now that of course can take a direct hit from a, a 20 megaton blast um the nearby cheyenne mountain complex has the alternate has the alternate alternate command center now this is norad um north american aerospace aerospace defense command which is supposed to defend against a Soviet nuclear attack, which would be the potential coming up in the coming years from Soviet bombers coming over the North Pole. The distant early warning line is here, and this is in the Arctic Circle. The pine tree line in here, and my grandfather served at one of these uh, spots. I believe he served in the mid one right up here up here you serve for usually 12 months i think it is uh, six to 12 months and the this is meant to alert these radar sites are meant to alert against an incoming attack and that information will come into canadian and american um, defense uh sites and of course norad in uh in colorado outside of colorado springs so Canada's NORAD uh, center is right at headquarters at CFB Winnipeg, Manitoba. It was established in, um, that was actually established in 1983, and it is responsible for providing surveillance and control of Canadian airspace. So, and that's from, that's later on in the Cold War and up and up to now, I believe it is. But of course, uh, the cooperation has been, very, very huge throughout the Cold War, including Canadian Air Force bases armed with the CF-100s, CF-101s, all the way to CF-104s, uh, able to launch with air-to-air -air Genie missiles and shoot down these bombers um, with nuclear warheads on them. They, there are, you know, they will uh, pull 
12 hour shift alert or 24 hour alert but they're on alert 24 hours a day there are two pilot systems there are two groups they will serve one side and one will serve for 12 hours and another will serve another 12 hours at least that's um from going from memory um that alert it's just similar exactly similar to how the missile sites and the missile silos will play out up until today norad in itself i mean they had radar sets and, and agreements before this but norad in itself of course they had agreements uh before this for mutual defense and whatnot but then it became clear in the mid to late 50s that the, that the soviet union really had the potential to drop uh, nuclear weapons on america american and canadian cities and finally in september 1957 the two nations agreed to create the north american air defense command that was in 1957 when it was actually created um and headquarters in colorado springs of course as a bilateral command centralizing operational control and uh continental uh air defenses against the threat of soviet bombers on uh, may 12 1958 the agreement between the canadian and u.s governments that established nato was formalized finally form formalized and this map shows exactly uh similar to what i'm talking about here's the cf 100 here and these are of course canadian fighters equipped to deal with soviet bombers and there's uh the red ensign and the american um the american national flag and norad headquarters um of course so the agreement included 11 principles governing the organization and operation of norad and called for a renewal of the agreement in 10 years in which they certainly did in uh, the first renewal agreement came in march 1968 and it kept being revised and uh, of course they had to keep upgrading systems upgrading systems all the time because then missiles icbms intercontinental ballistic missiles with uh, after the launch uh, a year later in 1958 uh no 1957 rather uh sputnik is launched and that this is the uh begins the age of missile where missiles can be launched over the pole and hit western air bases and cities uh throughout north america it's a real threat and a real situation that could be very um very hectic within a matter of minutes millions upon millions could be dead so going back to um a few years back to 1948 and then uh, a year before the Soviet bomb was dropped and then 19 to 1950 much like the Western sphere that is uh, trying to protect Turkey and, and other countries uh, Thailand and and other countries in Asia including Japan a newly formed ally after the war uh, from uh, becoming communist countries the Soviet Union is spreading its influence throughout throughout asia and and uh, certainly in europe and here we go again communism versus capitalism and the there's so much mistrust and competition between countries that, that of course proxy wars are going to break out and the first official one being the korean war um so on the first of may 1948 the of course the northern sector which is under soviet control and the southern uh, sector which is under uh, western um, control of course they split the korean peninsula was liberated from japanese occupation by both soviet and american forces in late in the second world war the soviets and americans and their korean supporters could not agree on the country's form of government while the un just very much like germany <laughs> but becomes certainly more volatile very quickly very quickly well the un oversaw democratic elections in south korea the soviet union forbade them in the north so the korean war uh, officially is begins on the 25th of june 1950 because the um this is a year after the 
Chinese communists take over and beat the Chinese nationalists, which is uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, and they push him to Taiwan, which is uh, t today what they call Taiwan or the Republic of China. Um, the Chinese communists led by Mao Zedong uh, lead a new uh, major power in Asia under communist rule. And of course, he has the help and support of Kim Il sung, the communist leader of the North, which will create what we know today as North Korea. So then of course, I'll talk about the development of leadership here and how it, how it comes into play. Of course, and, and then of course, it starts with the North Koreans uh, attacking the South. Now, when North Korean armed forces invaded South Korea, and that was on 25th of June 1950, the war's combat uh, phase lasted until an armistice was signed on 27th of July 1953 as part of the United Nations UN force. 26,791 Canadian military personnel served in the Korean War. Alongside the Americans, we pushed our resources in there to try to prevent the North from taking the South. And we were successful. So, um, during both the combat phase and as peacekeepers afterward, uh, that's how many served in uh, Korea. After the two world wars, Korea remains Canada's third bloodiest overseas conflict, taking the lives of 516 Canadians and wounding more than 1,200. But little, uh, little does it seem uh, possible, of course, that these countries are created in 1948. You know, the two years, roughly, almost two years later, the North is invading the South with a horrific loss of life, in that essence as well, and the North almost wins. Uh, North and South Korea were established in the Western-backed Republic of Korea and the Communist-backed Democratic People's Republic of Korea um, were established, and that was uh, August 15, 1948. The South Korean flag and of course the North Korean flag. The North of course is led by uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, grandfather which is uh, Kim Il-sung, a revolutionary communist leader that takes over the North. He's actually born, um, of course, he is, of course, Korean-born, and of course, his son, the dynasty, um, Kim Jong-il, uh, is born, actually, in a, uh, a Soviet camp in 1942, I believe it is. So, they are born into the, in a, well, of course, this Kim Il-sung's son, Kim Jong-il, is born into this, into the, uh, the dynasty, and then, of course, once Kim Jong-il pass away uh, just a few years ago. Then we have, of course, uh, Kim Jong-un that takes over and is the third leader in which we see today. So the establishment of the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party, um, the Communist victory in 1949 brought to power a peasant party that had learned its techniques in the countryside but had adopted Marxist ideology and believed in class struggle and rapid industrial development. Extensive experience in running base areas and waging war before 1949 had given the Chinese Communist Party deep, deeply ingrained operational habits and uh, proclivities. The long civil war that created the new nation, however, had been one of peasants triumphing over urban dwellers and had uh, involved the destruction of the old ruling classes. In addition, the party leaders recognized that they had no experience in overseeing the transitions to socialism and industrialism that would occur in China's huge urban centers. For this, they turned to the only government with such an experience, and that was the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, and of course <clears throat> Mao Zedong became close 
allies in the fight against Western, what they call what they call Western imperialism. Western hostility against the People's Republic of China sharpened by the Korean War because China's troops are directly involved and uh, Canadians are killing them and they're killing Canadians. Um, and which contributed to the intensity of the ensuing Sino-Soviet relationship. So October 1st, 1949, the anniversary of the uh, founding of the People's Republic of China, Chinese Communist leader Mao Zedong uh, declared the creation of the People's Republic of China. The announcement ended the costly full-scale civil war between the Communist Party, uh, Chinese Communist Party, CCP, and the Nationalist Party, or Kuomintang, KMT, which broke out immediately following the Second World War and had been preceded uh, by on and off conflict between the two sides since the 1920s. The creation of the PRC also completed the long process of governmental upheaval in China begun by the communist uh, by the Chinese Revolution of 1911. The fall of mainland China to communism in 1949 led to the United States to suspend diplomatic ties with the PRC for decades. The ability of the PRC and the United States to find common ground in the wake of the establishment of the new Chinese state was hampered by both diplomatic policies and global tensions as seen. In August of 1949, the Truman administration published the, Chinese, the China White Paper, which explained past U.S. policies toward China based upon the principle that only Chinese forces could de determine the outcome of their civil war. Ultimately, the Truman Ultimately, for Truman, this failed to protect uh, his administration from charges of having lost China. As you can see here, of course, here's the, the North Korean and Chinese border. And uh, there's Harbin, uh, the closest major city to, uh, well, Xinjiang and Harbin. And then this is Manchuria, of course. And a lot of this was uh, occupied by Japanese, uh, Imperial Japanese forces. In the Second World War, and all down the line here through uh, Beijing, Nanjing, and Shanghai, uh, Nanjing, and of course Wuhan, um, th those areas are all um, largely, at least most of these areas, of course, are were occupied at some point by the uh, the Japanese, but then of course they're put once they're pushed out, and the Japanese, uh, they're pushed out by the by the nationalists and and the Chinese fighting forces alongside, uh, fighting alongside the Americans and and the British and uh, and uh, and our allies. Um, and of course, the eventually, of course, the Soviet Union also joins in and declares war on um, on Japan just before they surrender. Um, <clears throat> That uh, eventually leads to, of course, Japan's surrender, and uh, of course, the civil war breaks out from, of course, from forty-five onward to forty-nine, and it ends with Mao Zedong becoming leader, um, chairman of the uh, CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, and the People's Republic of China is formed. Um, that would be October first, nineteen forty-nine. And then, of course, with the support, of course, uh, with the creation of the uh, and the Soviet-backed um, North Koreans, and then the Western-backed South Koreans, you can see where the alliances come into play. The Chinese certainly do their best to help the North Koreans, and they do. They actually save North Korea from complete defeat by American forces in the war in 1950. Um, and they saved South Korea, uh, the Americans saved South Korea, and then we, you have the push and, uh, push and, and shove back and forth that goes on on the 38th parallel until 1953. So China was very much uh, able to help in, uh, by a volunteer, sending a volunteer army with uh, hundreds of thousands of troops down, trickling down North Korea, pushing the Americans back. And with the help um, of, <clears throat> of 
Mio Zitong, um, Kim Il Sung is able to, uh, his government is able to survive and fight onward. Um, Sung himself, of course, under his leadership, North Korea was established as a communist state with a public, publicly owned and planned economy. He had a close political connections, of course, with the Soviet Union. It's in the war. Its only ally was the Soviet Union and China. While the South Koreans had the, of course, the entire world essentially uh, on their side. And of course, with the support of uh, Mil Zitong, and of course, uh, the leadership of North Korea, of uh, sorry, um, the Soviet Union, then the that of course was pivotal in weapons and in the survival of the um, of the North Korean state, the weapons and supplies from China, and of course, um, Soviet Union. Here we have uh, Mao Zedong uh, shaking hands with uh, Kim Il Sung, and of course this is early, very early in the leadership. This is right before the war, I believe. Um, so, famous picture of him uh, giving one one of his speeches. Uh, of course, um, despite United Nations plans to conduct all Korean elections, the Soviets held their elections of their own. And this is how he got the power um, for us. This is, of course, it was all under control in their zone from August uh, 25th, 1948. And then that's for a Supreme People's Assembly. And this was a, a, a communist dominated um, operation, of course. Um, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea so on, was proclaimed on September 9th, 1948, with Kim as the Soviet-designated premier. So with the large military uh, Soviet uh, tanks, uh, obviously Soviet-equipped tanks, T-34s uh, and T-34-85s, and onward, uh, Soviet-equipped military PPSH uh, submachine guns, uh, um, Mosin Nagant rifles. The, I mean, that's the the mainstay of the <clears throat> the North Korean military, the North, the People's uh, Korean Army Ground Force, um, invaded South Korea um, on June twenty fifth, nineteen fifty. At dawn, the People's Republic uh, of Korea crossed the thirty eighth parallel behind artillery fire, invading South Korea. So, Secretary of State for External Affairs Lester Pearson called for a Canadian response to the invasion of the Republic of Korea through the United Nations and under U.S. military leadership. General MacArthur is um, in command of the Pacific, uh, U.S. forces in the Pacific, based in Japan, and he is going to be heading the overall operation to um, assist South Korea. Canada, so Canada also expands its presence in the Korean War. Um, Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent um, announced the creation of a Canadian Army Special Force, later named the 25th Canadian Infantry Brigade Group, to serve under the United Nations in Korea. The invasion of South Korea came as a surprise to the United Nations. For the war began, the United Nations immediately drafted UN Resolution um, UNSC 82. And that called for all hostilities to end in North Korea to withdraw to the 38th parallel. A UN Commission on Korea uh, to be formed to monitor the situation and report to the Security Council. All UN members to support the United Nations in achieving this and refrain from providing assistance to the North Korean authorities. When the North Korean army crossed into South Korea on 25th of June 1950, they advanced for the capital of Seoul, which fell in about three days. Three days. North Korea's uh, forces continued to, uh, they continued right toward the port of uh, Pusan, taking most of the peninsula with them. A strategic goal and the seat of the ROK government. The forces of the North uh, conquered all of Korea 
except for this tiny enclave at the end of the peninsula. The war was nearly won by the DPRK. Uh, certainly in two days, the United States offered assistance and the United uh, Nations Security Council asked its members to help um, repel the North Korean attack. Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and South Africa, the Philippines, Australia, Ethiopia, and other countries sent troops to Korea under a United Nations Security Council resolution. Between 1950 and 1956, over 25,000 Canadians served in Korea and 516 killed. And there's different um, sources that, that uh, waver in certain numbers, but roughly that's what we have here. The United States, uh, so the United Nations Memorial uh, Cemetery in uh, Busan, uh, South Korea, has the remains of 378 Canadians who died during the war. So here we have the North Korean invasion, and this is in 1950. This is, of course, um, pushing down through the, this is the North Korean advance, and this is Pusan. And this is the area where, of course, Americans uh, and, and then eventually Canadians will land. So August to September 1950, U.S. forces helped push back uh, North Korean forces with the South Koreans. But then, of course, the uh, Marine landings at Incheon, and that was September 15th. Um, and this here is what was designed to cut off the, the North Korean supply lines and then to uh, take back Seoul and then <clears throat> push through. And so, and so they allowed the troops at Pusan to push up and then, and then connect with the troops at, from Incheon and then push through to Penmunjom and then, of course, the 38th parallel. Um, so that's the UN offensive through here in the yellow, through here, through here. And they push up so, so through quite fast in September 1950. The North Korean line basically collapses and they're pushed all through, all through the, uh, to Pyongyang. They capture Pyongyang. And that, that uh, Pyongyang is just devastated. They're, I mean, if they, in, in uh, the Korean War, they dropped nearly just as many uh, bombs, carpet bombing North Korea as they had in Germany in the Second World War. And uh, by uh, the mid-war, 52-53, there was nothing left of Pyongyang. Hardly a house standing. It, it's just unbelievable. Um, death toll in this war is over three, over four, three, four million uh, Koreans. Um, over three million. I'll take a look at the figures, but I think it is that many. Um, and of course, they're pushing through, and, and they finally, the UN forces reach the uh, Yalu River area, um, which is borderline with China. And so approaching the river line and uh, the Chang, uh, Changjin Reservoir, um, this is where the, of course, the Chinese are poised to launch a massive uh, strike southward into um, North Korea and to prevent, because the Chinese are worried that certainly that uh, the Americans will try to uh, start invading the Chinese homeland. And uh, of course, this plan uh, started um, <clears throat> this plan started when the Americans took Pyongyang, the capital, and uh, so now the the Chinese are poised to respond and to protect themselves, but also to defend their neighbor. But keep in mind that uh, the, the North Koreans had already suffered um, over 200,000 uh, casualties, uh, killed or wounded. Uh, so, for a total of roughly uh, 335,000 uh, since the end of June 1950, now from this time. So, uh, in October, uh, President, to President Truman, who was meeting with um, General MacArthur on Wake Island, uh, MacArthur speculated there was little risk of Chinese intervention in Korea and that the PRC, the People's uh, Republic of China's opportunity for aiding the uh, Korean People's Army had lapsed. 
He believed that the PRC had some 300,000 soldiers in Manchuria and some 100, 100 to 125,000 soldiers at the Yellow River. He concluded that although half of the, those forces might cross south, if the Chinese tried to get down to Pyongyang, uh, there would be uh, the greatest slaughter without uh, air force protection. And that was not necessarily true. And when they did attack, um, of course, um, that proved uh, fatal for many U.S. troops as well as Chinese. Um, uh, after secretly crossing the Yellow River on the, the 19th of October, uh, the first uh, or the 13th PVA Army Group launched the first phase uh, offensive on, a, on the 25th of October, attacking the advancing UN forces near the Sino-Korean border. This military decision was made solely by China uh, and of course changed the attitude um, of the support from the Soviet Union. Now, I told these after the PVA troops entered the, uh, the war, Stalin allowed the Soviet Air Force to provide air cover and supported, supported more aid to China. So, um, the little did, uh, of course, it was a big state secret from the Soviet Union that the uh, Soviets were allowing uh, new MiG-15 uh, jet fighters with Soviet pilots to defend North Korea and uh, China in uh, support uh, against UN forces. And that, and of course, so the Chinese offensive, the Chinese push everybody down this line up to the 38th parallel. Um, back to originally where the war started from, roughly, and uh, and that really little changed until the truce in 1953. So at peak strength, the uh, Chinese forces had maybe uh, 1.4 uh, million, over 1.4 and a half million um, <clears throat> troops in uh, North Korea amazing and they could spare the numbers uh, peak strength um, the North Korean army was only 266,600 and the Soviet Union maybe had 26,000 um, US forces at peak strength were 326,000 in uh, Korea and uh, the South Koreans had a peak strength of you know with conscri conscription um, uh, people have uh, men over you know 18 to 30 602,902. So this certainly, uh, the amount of uh, manpower is impressive for a small peninsula. Um, here's another picture here showing that when China entered the war, and by the end of October 1950, thousands of Chinese soldiers, you know, like hundreds of thousands. Um, so roughly, 100,000 and into one area and up to yeah over two two or three hundred thousand crossed and uh, pushed them down as you can see here November 1950 to January 1951 and then here's a ceasefire law and how this uh, roughly how it all started here's another map this is before the war and then of course uh, North Korean advance uh, you can see where the arrows are and that's just uh, here another diagram the really the total death toll is r roughly 2.5 million 2.7 million casualties a lot of casualties um, of course we lost maybe only over 600 dead maybe up to up to around a thousand to twelve hundred uh, included wounded so that's dead and wounded um, more than 26,000 Canadians served in the Korean War and approximately 7,000 continued to serve in the theater from the armistice to, to August 1957 the first Canadian uh, troops departed uh, for Korea uh, soon after in the months after the start of the conflict the first contingent of Canadian troops were the 2nd Battalion Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry um, and this is them departing, uh, that this is either them or another unit departed for Korea. The United States led the decision to help the R ROK through the UN. 
and the UN General Assembly was dominated by Western countries since the Soviets were boycotting the Security Council because of the UN's refusal to include the new communist Chinese regime as one of its five permanent members. The Soviets could not exercise a veto. The Security Council thus condemned a North Korean aggression and uh, called on UN members to render every assistance to the ROK. And that was in the beginning of the conflict. On the 28th of June 1950, Lester B. Pearson, Canada's Secretary of State for External Affairs, encouraged a Canadian response through the UN and under U.S. military leadership. In the government's view, Canada would fight for the UN and the principle of collective security. Here's another map of the, uh, the detailed landings. Um, so, of course, from Pusan uh, on the 8th and pushing in, 8th Army pushing in through here to Tijan. And then you have, of course, uh, elements of the 1st Cavalry. These are units uh, with that are um, in the um, Incheon landings, September 15th. And they push together. These units here from the south push up and they meet meet up and cutting off a large section of the south that might be under uh, that is under um, North Korean leadership and push forward uh, forward up uh, and as they're pushing to Seoul so the it deteriorates quickly for the North Koreans early in the war so of course the main rifles some of the main rifles being used uh, throughout the Cold War and throughout the early days and certainly in Korea the Lee Enfield um, Number four Mark One and number four Mark Two rifles, uh, short magazine Lee Enfield, which uh, as I've explained before, carry two um, clips, uh, five round clips that can fit in up top in the open chambering. Um, bolt action rifle, so you're fitting f two five uh, round clips, in which uh, these are the standard is bolt action. Uh, rifles which are uh, these caliber 303 British later on in the war I'll talk about the of course um, other weapons that we use uh, the FNC 1A1 which is on the bottom here which is 7.62 times 51 standard NATO it is a weapon that we've used up until the FNC 1 FNC 2 in in the Cold War theaters and peacekeeping theaters well uh, up until 1984 and when we got the C7, which is our, and uh, the Canadian version of the American um, M16A1E1. Um, so, all right. So this is more with the Incheon landings. Uh, since the beginning of the conflict that, uh, that started in June, South Korean and United Nations forces have been steadily driven south. And this is more just of what I've talked about. Far from the Pusan perimeter, his troops began landing uh, on September 15th and caught the North Koreans by surprise. So, getting them, um, helping the South Koreans, but also hitting them from behind. Um, the, lo the landings coupled with an offensive from the Pusan perimeter caused the North Koreans to retreat back to the 30th parallel. And that's you know, South Korean troops here with American troops. So initially, Canada contributed, or what our contributions are, contributed to three Royal Canadian Navy destroyers, HMCS Athabascan, HMCS Cayuga, and HMCS Essex, and uh, uh, Royal Canadian Air Force Transport Squadron, number 426 Thunderbird Squadron. American, UN, and domestic pressure then led to Prime Minister Louis and Lawrence's announcement on 7th of August 1950 of a Canadian Army Special Force, later named the 25th. Canadian Infantry Brigade Group to expand the country's UN contributions to Korea. This here is HMCS Soax, uh, which is a V-class destroyer of the Royal Canadian Navy. Of course, it's a it's a, a destroyer that was in the Second World War, and of course, um, she was launched as HMC, HMS Vixen for the British Royal Navy, but before being transferred to the Royal Canadian Navy, uh, she was then named Soax Sue. HMCS Sioux, my apologies. Uh, so, she named the Sioux uh, for the people of Canada's western provinces. So, she was construction, she was uh, launched in, in 1943. So, one of our first destroyers to uh, hit um, off 
hit uh, targets uh, and assist forces in uh, South Korea. The other two destroyers were um, uh, the HMCS Athabascan, as I mentioned, uh, and the Athabascan II and HMCS Cayuga were tribal class destroyers that served uh, in the immediate post Second World War era um, and, of course, in Korea as well. It appeared that the war would be short lived. Under U.S. General Douglas MacArthur, U.N. forces drove the, UN, the North Koreans back, first to the 38th parallel, then to Korea's border with China. However, by the end of October 1950, thousands of Chinese army volunteers crossed the, uh, the Yalu River into North Korea, driving the U.N. forces back south, of course. And this is more just of what I've talked about, and this is another map here. So I've talked mainly about a lot of this here. Um... So, uh, some of what Canada did um, in November 1950, the Canadian Army's Brigade, Canadian Army Brigade 2nd Battalion, Patr uh, PPCLI, what we call Pat Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry Regiment, was sent overseas and landed in Korea in December. In May 1951, the rest of the Canadian Brigade arrived. For the Army, the Korean War became largely a war of patrols in rough mountainous terrain uh, but infantry tank and artillery units were also involved in heavy fighting at the battles of Kapyong uh, 22nd to the 25th of April 1951 Hill 355 also known as Kawang San 22 actions uh, or sorry uh, Kawang San and that's uh, 22nd to the 25th of November 1951 and 22nd to 24th of October 1952 and Hill um, 187 2nd and the 3rd of May 1953 among many other um, actions. Eight Canadian warships uh, took turns in Korean water protecting UN aircraft carriers, busting enemy trains along the coast and helping other onshore operations. And some of those ships uh, got known as, what was it, the Train Busters? Um, train Blaster, Train Busters. Uh, I read something about that. It's where um, the Sioux is one of them, and uh, there's a number of them that, that actually were able to bust trains and destroy North Korean uh, armament trains going south. Um, the Air Force's transport planes ferried people and materials across the Pacific Ocean. Well, 22 Canadian pilots flew jet aircraft with the United States Air Force in Korea. There's some of our troops here. After several months of movement by both sides in mid-1951, the front lines became static near the 30th parallel. Until the war ended, the fighting took place along these lines, mostly consisting of patrols and raids against hilltop trench positions across the area in between UN and enemy lines, known as No Man's Land. During the two years that followed the 1953 armistice, Canadians continued to serve in Korea. Many were troops who guarded and patrolled the ROK side of the demilitarized zone, DMZ, which continues to separate the two Koreas. All Canadian Armed Forces personnel who served in Korea from 1950 to 1957 are considered Korean War veterans. So here, truce signed. A famous picture of the truce being signed. So the armistice was signed on the 27th of July 1953 and was designated uh, uh, to ensure, designed to ensure a complete cessation of all hostilities of all acts of armed force in Korea until final peaceful um, it was finally concrete. So first was, of course, the adoption of an agenda. Uh, comes in the five, sta five stages. S fixing a military demarcation line between the two sides so as to establish a demilitarized zone as a basic condition for the cessation of hostilities in Korea. And that's, uh, that's two. First one is adopting agenda. Fixing a military demarcation line is two. Concrete arrangements for realization of a ceasefire and armistice in Korea, including the composition, authority, and functions of a, a supervisory organization for carrying out the terms of a truce and armistice. That's three. Four is the arrangements relating to prisoners of war. 
5. Recommendations to the governments of the countries concerned on both sides. So after this, the agenda was decided, talks proceeded slowly. Um, these were lengthy intervals between meetings. The, the longest gap between dis discussions started on um, 23rd of August, 1951. So th these, so this is what um, the five-part agenda uh, need to be put into place after so after a period of two weeks on uh 26 of june 1951 a five-part agenda was agreed upon and this guided talks until the signing of the armistice until the 27th of july 1953 and those are the five so going back to the major picture of the cold war uh so this is the uh end of part two so i am going to do a third part because this is going to be a much longer presentation than i thought so because there's so much more to talk about and um, there's going to be a lot more put in with this. So, um, yeah, I have another, uh, I'm going to do the other, the third part of the Cold War presentation here uh, tomorrow, the next day. And uh, so, all right, this is completion of part one, of part two of Canada in the Cold War. Aaron Bulma, Military Specialist for Carlton County.